All right, and welcome to the Vanu Podcast, a podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, that website is Pasnia, P A Z N I A dot com. If you'd like to learn all about this Second Realm Network uh, that we're in the process of building. Uh, on that note, the first event of year two here at Pasnia has been announced uh, with the coming of warm weather, March 31st to April 4th. Marks our now annual spring camping event uh, at our Church of Self-Liberation, uh, the nature, nature Sanctuary here at, at the Free Republic. Uh, all vetted Pasnians and self-liberators are encouraged to attend. Uh, the only items on the docket thus far, uh, lamb and bird processing and probably cleaning out a uh, shed here on the property as uh, we transition over to uh, the other larger field, or transition the ruminants over, rather. And, uh, yeah, as always on the docket, a uh, reinvigorated week, uh, reinvigorating weekend of liberation uh, here at the Free Republic of Pasnia. Uh, again, the website is pasnia.com if you, if you uh, need help getting vetted uh, or wish to learn more. And I actually did just help someone get vetted today, so it's not a, it's not a hard process. Usually we can find, um, if, I, if, it's, if it's not a physical, um, you know, vetting, uh, you know, vetted connection, um, the digital second realm is also, is usually, usually worthwhile. It's not that big of a network when you, or a community when you really think about it. Uh, but anyway, uh, today we, we return to the uh, topic of crypto anarchism, uh, building the digital second realm. As I'm joined w uh, once again by our good friend, uh, Jamin Bakonic. Uh, Jamin is a hardware hacker, permaculture farmer, and uh, someone I'm definitely appreciative uh, to know and have here in the network uh, for many, many reasons. But uh, anyway, I'll let him introduce, introduce himself a little further. Uh, but uh, we'll leave it there for now and uh, bring him in. Uh, Jamin, welcome back to the Vonning Podcast, man. How are things going? Oh, pretty good, Shane. Thanks for having me back. Hey, not a problem. Um, yeah, just pretty much working on the uh, the different projects, the ghost phones and the ghost boxes, and um, coming up with a strategy that people can follow to uh, have some more autonomy in the digital realm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, definitely. It's basically, my uh, my thing at this point. Right on. Right on. So, Jamin, the past couple of years has been good, um, has been really great for liberation. Uh, and so we do have some new listeners out there. Um, so could you start with a brief introduction? Uh, who are you and, uh, you know, what do you do? Sure. Um, I'm basically a researcher and a permaculture farmer and, I guess, hardware hacker. Um, I concentrate on self-liberation and the technology to you know, bolster that and, uh, help that along. Um, and it's, you know, it's not just with the permaculture farming. I'm really into, uh, kind of, you know, Jungian analytical psychology at this point and like the, you know, concept of individuation and like, um, you know, the, the associated, you know, sciences and ideas behind that. Um, but really, I think, uh, you know, I'm focused on this project now because I really see how the unfettered flow of communication is what really has prompted this, you know, shift in consciousness. And that if this does, if this can't continue this way and people can't communicate freely with each other, then all the dis distributed networks that have formed um, aren't going to be very effective and they're not going to... Uh, they're not going to be able to do what they could do. Um, if you can't communicate, especially when you're basically part of a dispersed tribe at this point, if you can't communicate without being monitored and, um, you know, having, you know, bad results from that monitoring mm -hmm. and um, there's chilling in the communication where you're not allowed to say certain things, I'm, it basically hamstrings anything, you know, anything going forward um, like with what you're, you know, what you're putting forth with the Pasnias and everything, you know, mm -hmm. you, you can't have that type of dispersed network without good, secure, private communication. So right. I think it's really like a fundamental root that I'm striking at. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I definitely agree, man. I definitely agree. It's, uh, it's been time for, for a while, but, um, really I think, and it's something that, you know, it's, it makes sense for, you know, these, these, you know, rapidly changing open source, you know, development spaces, but, um, like it had to get to us like the, some of this tech, some of this technology had to get to a certain level, a certain level, a certain level of user friendliness. Um, and now I think we're, we're at that point. So like, uh, it's, it's now like, it's and I'm obviously, you know, like there's plenty of, plenty of digital second realm stuff before, but, uh, you know, it's obviously an expanding, expanding realm. 
Um, and, uh, yeah, with the, you know, the ghost phones, the freedom boxes, and, uh, I guess the more overall architecture that you, you're kind of, uh, we've, we've talked a little bit about and that we'll get to today. Um, but I wanted to mention for, uh, the benefit of the, uh, of the, I guess the podcast listeners, if, uh, that you've all, you've been on this podcast a number of times, uh, TVP number 58, uh, homebrew cyber weapons for fun and profit, uh, with Jamin, uh, that was back in July of 2019. And, uh, he was also a part of, uh, TVP 127. Uh, the special 200th episode. Um, so you can uh, find him there. And I think there was also an episode at uh, um, Evaluate Radio 2, or I think it was called like... Um, yeah, there were a couple. It was like uh, Crypto Anarchy and uh, Permaculture, The Path to Freedom or something like that. Um, and, and maybe I'll, I need to actually yeah, repost that yeah, on, the, on the... on that. I need to repost uh, that that podcast on this on this feed because the LUA site is really only for publishing. So if anyone ever tries to go to the podcast feed there, it won't work. Um, stuff didn't get sh- switched over in the okay. shuffle and... And it's all uh, anything worthwhile is on, on the Vonnie podcast feed now. But um, anyway, Jamin, we yeah, I, I know we've, I, I've yeah, seen ahead. that. Uh, oh, I, I've seen that you've been putting uh, older episodes uh, reposting on YouTube. That's really cool. On the YouTube channel, yep. Been like reposting the older stuff. Yep, and there's Odyssey a lot too. of value in mm-hmm. a lot of the stuff that you've done, man. Well, I appreciate that. It's yeah. definitely one of my favorite Liberty Casts. Right on, right on. Well, uh, I, I definitely appreciate it, and, and, and yeah, I'm just trying to make things as redundant as possible. Now that I, I have uh, you know two uh, two Odyssey channels, um, and then the podcast feed, and, and and my own my own reserves and backups. Um, but uh, yeah, trying to and, and also I guess it's been a lot of that stuff came out in 2017, so um, especially yeah. for our newer listeners over the past couple of years, uh, there's a lot of a lot of stuff. Um, so yeah, reposting oh, yeah. reposting a little bit. A lot of root striking stuff too. I mean, you really did focus on a lot of actionable things instead of a lot of profanication profon- <laughs> about <laughs> theory, right? Mm-hmm. Yep, yep, certainly. Well, uh, I guess uh, um, I, I know that what, one of the things we talked about on, I think it was probably in, in that TVP 58, um, or whatever number I said, fi- yeah, 58, uh, we talked about your ghost pads, and uh, I think that was about the first time that we listed. Um, we listed one of the, like the Vanu pads on the on the Elio Publications website, which sold rather quick. I should I should add it was a, a Vanu pad with uh, you know some 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 cool uh, I don't know what to call it hacking gear for lack of a better uh, descriptor. Um, yeah, so yeah. Um, yeah, I guess uh, you want to give us an update on the on uh, ghost pads. Uh, um, I guess uh, I know you you mentioned on the on the 200th episode that you can still build self liberators uh, custom systems, but what's uh, what's new with the ghost pads? Well. There has been a lot of uh, a lot of things as far as the model and generation of system that they are based on, especially my higher end ones. Um, since we've talked about it, and since I was selling a lot of those, um, there was an issue found with the GPU, and um, the it was a security issue. I forget what CVE it was. There there were a couple. And the results basically cripple the graphics performance to mitigate it. So they went from being um, fairly decent desktop replacements to um, just less, you know, things like watching video takes more CPU now and like moving the windows around. And so, I mean, they're still great for their original intended purpose for like, you know, private communication terminals where you can also you know, store your research and stuff, you know, the proverbial corner of the room where the cameras don't reach, right? They still work for that, but it's like so many people wanted them to be like a legit desktop replacement to like just use one of those and that's it and run, you know, a lot of lot of uh, computational and graphics intensive software on them and stuff. And it's really hard to upgrade them to this point to be that, to be that way. I'm actually looking at a, uh, a workstation ver- variant of the Lenovo's. I'm using one now. I have one that is modded into a ghost pad that has a discrete NVIDIA GPU in it. Hmm. So um, if I can get that to be, um, get that to be a thing, then I might be able to have the high end, the high end ghost pad that works decent as a desktop replacement. Um, I mean, I still use my, T420 all the time that has the mitigations and another mitigation that was also done too was um, there are multiple security risks involved 
in the low level stuff with Intel hyper threading. So hyper threading makes your processor appear to the system to have twice as many cores as it normally as it really has physically. It has logical cores, right? So they took a uh, multitasking performance hit because that has to be turned off. Um, but it's actually turning out to where the what I would call the first generation ghost pads, which are basically Libreboot firmware think pads, like uh, the last generation of the Intel Core 2 series. Mm -hmm. They actually perform on the desktop on par with the second generation ones now, now that the second generation ones had to have all those mitigations. Mm -hmm. So those are relatively simple and painless for me to put out. Those are what I was modifying for the Ministry of Freedom and um, can get fairly streamlined and pump a lot of those out. I have like I have like five of them sitting here that need various things. They were like my seconds. Like one of them has a bad latch that I have to repair. Do you know, when I get those done, I'll have like, you know, they'll be A grade when I'm done with them. Um, and then I'll start modifying more. I have... There's, see, the thing is, there's multiple ways to do the flashing to these. And I've had reliability issues with most of them to the mm -hmm. point where it's it drives you insane. Like, one, one day they work, and one day you can just hook up to the chip and flash like it's supposed to. And the next day, they just mysteriously stop working. And, like, it's a lot of troubleshooting, a lot of hair pulling. And um, so my fix is I have a new flash rig that has what's called a uh, SPI amplifier in it. And that should basically, long story short, give me better reliability on modifying them so it doesn't take me as long and it's not so frustrating. So when I get that, when I overcome the hurdle of having reliable equipment to do the modifications, because I'm doing in-circuit programming. I'm like basically taking a clip that clamps to the to the uh, EEPROM chip that's on the motherboard mm -hmm. and programming it that way. So it's there's much, much room for error. And uh, But I mean, that's why there's not a lot of people offering this service or these systems. Like there's another company that started offering the, uh, basically what I would term as my second generation ghost pad. They offer similar systems and um, they're over a grand. And it's because of how much um, not just experience and like know how to just get into doing it. It's like, it's a really um, frustrating and irritating process sometimes. Yeah, yeah. So, so, the, you're, so what, you're, what you're saying is the realm of hardware hacking has not gotten easier despite the user friendliness. No, no. I mean, like, I mean, especially when you're you're doing stuff like in circuit programming and like you know modifying. Modifying firmware with the chips when they're on the boards, there's a lot of variables to that. Yeah, I, I can only um, imagine. Wow. But once I over... it's But it's like a barrier to entry for me, though. Like, once I overcome this problem and I actually focus on it and get um, this new rig going properly, then it actually opens the door up to some other laptop models that I wasn't having success with before. And that includes mm. an HP workstation laptop, laptop that is, um, you know, fairly high powered and can accept a fairly current discrete GPU. Like I have, um, like I offer, I offer these just as Linux laptops without, you know, being firmware hardened too. But like they are the best value on the market for a, you know, general purpose laptop that is capable of gaming and everything, but still relatively locked down. So eventually, I want to be able to offer those in a GhostPad configuration along with the Lenovo's. So that's kind of my roadmap for that. Um, but I really have to focus on some of the uh, some of the mobile stuff because it's much higher demand. It's pretty much every customer that I sold a GhostPad to has been like, "That's great, but do you have a phone?" <laughs> so um, I really have to uh, kind of concentrate on the mobile thing. I have tablets too now. I have Divesto out divest OS tablets um, I'm using like uh, uh, Nexus 2013 model 7s 
which are actually if like you you know do research on tablets like they still hold their own as far as like a solid performing tablet goes um and those will be around 100 bucks so they'll be real real low barrier to entry to have some type of uh some type of device that's you know safe to use on your you know on your esoteric side of your network right and we'll talk about that uh, more at some point here right on um so yeah i guess uh that's a, it's a great update on the ghost pads um let's go, i guess let's get to what you're focusing on now with the ghost phones and i can provide some some actual first-hand experience on this um i uh purchased one of these uh it was perfect timing i was i've i've, I've recounted this a number of times on the podcast but i'll mention it here for your benefit jamin but i've got this uh it's like, it's like an iphone 7 it's just a but it's a busted ass iphone 7 and i've just been waiting for it to die and it was going to be it's going to be my last spy phone and uh, it won't die so um Jamin here, you know, finished these uh, these ghost phones up. They they're Pixel 3As um, with uh, Calyx OS on it, and um, so far, I mean, like pretty much any like open source thing I do, there's some sort of problem to troubleshoot, whether it's minor or major. Um, with like with the Calyx OS um, Pixel 3A, it's super user friendly. Um, I noticed that uh, it's got Rise VPN um, on there by default and Orbot. So um, when you connect to any network, you can have those have those automatically come on, always on. So you can be you connect yeah connected through a VPN and Tor. Um, but I would recommend, obviously, you know, as as we've talked about in this podcast before, two out via, two out VPNs are far superior. And I actually did find a uh, I don't recall the website offhand. Um, but uh, there's a website that offers a pretty good two hot VPN service that I might look into myself. Um, and then uh, something I've tweeted about and also posted about in the Pasnia Telegram chat. But uh, there's a website called silent.link. And uh, you can purchase uh, just data um, for a mobile phone. Or uh, you can actually get like a U.S. identity uh, with a phone number um, and inbound uh, or, uh, yeah, phone number, data, and uh, inbound text and voice. So um, it's, uh, pretty, it's pretty legit on that note, I will say. Uh, it was a major, major step up in the digital second realm. Um, I guess the other comments I have offhand are um, the F-Droid App Store is uh, is great. Um, Aurora is a great touch, too, um, which I guess Aurora would be. You can get some Google Play apps um, available on the Aurora Store. <coughs> um, and I might have you talk about this a little more, Jamin, but um, I noticed like sure. a, a G, uh, it's GSM, I think it has to do with Google services or G Google services manager or something. A lot of the apps are dependent upon that. And obviously like it depends, depends upon what level of security you're aiming for on the device. And obviously your, your knowledge and what your, what your goals are, of course, but um, I'm not get, I'm not allowing any Google on there. Um, so like it does shut you down or close you off from a lot of the apps in the app store and the app stores. But at the same time, um, <laughs> app, like coming from, you know, the shit Apple, um, they they restrict you so much. It's still like, it's still like uh, so much flexibility. Like there's there's a, there's a blue light blocker app, um, on like just uh, that on the on one of those Android stores. So like there's there's a lot of wild off the wall shit that you wouldn't really find, um, or that I haven't I haven't found on, on Apple. But uh, anyway, let's see if any any other. Um, uh, I guess the other comment that I that I I made here is there, yeah again exactly zero minutes of troubleshooting, um, and uh, yeah I guess that's that's my own experiences. I, I de I'm definitely definitely really really enjoying it. And uh, um, I guess uh, yeah tell us tell us a bit about uh, these these ghost phones, Jim, and um, security of Calyx OS. Uh, um, what you do to these phones to get them set up, uh, etc. Okay, so basically. Well, I guess we'll start with why use Google phones to de-Google, because that really seems antithetical. If you don't, if you're kind of not in the, in the in on the, you know, Android ecosystem. So Google devices are not only just, you know, are not only their devices that they, you know, their flagship hardware, they are reference designs meant for other manufacturers and other partners to look at and say, okay, we're going to implement something like this, right? So the Pixel series and the Nexus series are basically development developer-friendly devices, and they can be completely wiped of their entire OS, and you can put a completely different OS on them very easily because they have no locking from the factory of the boot, 
bootloader. Like a lot of devices out there, their bootloaders are locked, meaning that you can't boot a different operating system on there because it's a part of the memory that's like protected and you can't overwrite that with something else. So there, those devices can only be hardened so much and it's really, you know, it, it's really not very much. Um, now these devices, they, you know, the, <clears throat> any of the Nexus or the um, Pixel series, they are factory unlocked from the, you know, from Google, unless you get a Verizon. Um, the Verizon ones are bootloader locked because Verizon are the worst when it comes to that. So that's why the Pixel is being used by all these pro projects. Now, the Pixel is pretty much the sole device being used by Calyx OS, as well as Graphene OS. Um, the difference between Calyx and Graphene is that Calyx comes with a lot of pre-installed software that most users are probably going to want to put on their device anyway. And Calyx, for people who use Signal, is probably the better solution simply because it pulls in Signal from a repository and that whole process does all the crypt cryptographic checking of the file to make sure it's the right, you know, the real signal and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And it makes it so that since you're not getting it from play, that you don't have to keep going to Signal's website every time there's a new version out and downloading it and manually installing it. So Calyx makes integration of Signal a lot easier. Um, it also makes integration of um, some Google services easier. Now, when I ship them to just a random customer, I ship them in the configuration where they get to choose at setup whether or not to allow micro G, which is like Google emulation that emulates the Google services and sends falsified anon mm -hmm. anonymized data to Google in order to get, you know, in order to satisfy the dependency. So basically, um, I kind of lost where I, where I was going with that. Oh, the, uh, yeah. the differences between Calyx and so, I mean, you know, so Calyx makes it easier for most people in the use case that I'm marketing to right now to just pick up the phone and use it without scouring app stores and you know, doing a lot of things. They already it already has all the common stuff that someone's going to need. Not only that, if someone buys, you know, like if someone buys one and they want it as a part of an information system that I'm offering, it'll come set up with the Freedom Box app that basically will um, it. What the app does is it will find Freedom Boxes on your network or you can tell them where they are, like on the network, and then it shows you all the different Freedom Box services it's running, and it has single click installs to the client software to use that service. And that's all through F-Droid. Mm -hmm. So basically it makes it so um, you can easily set up a client device to work with somebody's Freedom Box without really having um, without knowing off the top of your head what client apps work with what servers and all that stuff. It's just a simple integration. Um, so, you know, I do offer the Graphene OS phones for people who want to build from scratch. I mean, when you get a Graphene OS phone, it has nothing on it. You know, it has your base as a file manager. It has your basic, you know, um, telephony program for phone usage and a handful of just basic bare bones operating system level apps, right? Mm -hmm. And you build on top of that exactly what you want. And Calyx, Calyx pretty much comes pre-configured to most users' needs without being over the top with having too many applications, which is bad because that makes a larger attack surface and not having enough applications to make the device usable for its intended purpose. Mm-hmm.
So that, I mean, that's really the, my, that's why I chose Calyx over graphene to concentrate on. Graphene's great. I have graphene devices I've been messing with, but in, in the end, I end up turning them into a Calyx device with all the software I put on them. So mm -hmm. it's like, um, I could just do that, have it out of the box configured like that, or I could spend, you know, an hour setting up my phone. Right. It's kind of like one of those deals. Right. Um, they both have like low level hardening done to them. Um, and when, when I ship a Calyx device fully configured, I don't include micro G like it's Google free as much as it can be, which is pretty much a hundred percent at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, Google is probably the biggest offender that everybody has to worry about as far as data collection so the more you can avoid using anything google the better you're off you're not going to buy a device that's going to let you you know get on a, a lot of these data collection services and not have some type of consequence yeah. it's uh, a lot of this is also good you know good privacy and security practices with a device that's hardened is what will ultimately uh be successful yeah right on man and yeah i can i can again attest to the, the user friendliness of it and um yeah uh yeah it comes stock with a lot of a lot of really important apps including briar which uh, we've talked about with brian sovereign on here before and uh brian will actually i'll actually be talking to brian next week and uh figure i'll get his uh 2022 uh quick update on the dark android some of the dark android stuff so if you guys are interested in this topic you get another episode uh, next week sometime but uh um yeah oh, i mean yeah. I'm, I'm getting i'm getting really close man to uh, to negating the need for my spy phone at all um i've barely used it in the past week and it's been it's been incredible um other than uh, i'll retain the number for the for telegram um because telegram still um telegram still doesn't work with silent.link so i cause I, c I couldn't get any verification codes to to set up a new uh, you know a, a different account there um, so telegram might not work, but, huh. um, signal, signal worked fine. Um, so yeah, oh, I'll, yeah, yeah. I'll retain the telegram Signal's number. pretty easy that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It worked well. It worked well. Um, and, um, I guess really the only, the well, last step, cool to, the last um, step is I, I see you download some music on there. Um, cause I've been using Spotify admittedly for, for a while. Um, oh, so yeah, yeah, I got, yeah. I got to actually physically download it, which is, it's, it's not a big deal. Just got to do it. And then. I mean, yeah, I've got a I've got a podcast app I use on there, and that's that's mostly what I did on my phone anyway was listen, listen to podcasts and such. So, yeah, you can definitely do that. And I think I'm pretty sure that I uh, I put Cody on your phone. Mm -hmm. So when you when you put some music on there, I mean, that's a really really good music player. Is it okay? Good to know. It play it plays everything. I mean, it it's what I recommend for uh, media consumption. Like it plays music, videos, streams. Now it's also something though you, you have to be careful with, you know, using it on, you know, a, a clean device or a, you know a reasonably private and secure device because there's a lot of plugins you can install uh. that might be sketch. So as long as you run code in without Cody without installing like the plugins and everything else, it's good to go. But there is a ability to install Cody plugins through Cody, and. Uh, <laughs> You would just want to research those plugins a little bit to make sure you weren't pulling in something sketchy. Sure. Sure. Understood. Understood. So, uh, yeah, if any listeners are interested in picking up uh, one of these uh, these ghost phones, uh, Jamin's got his website, which uh, is neuron.ghostpad.net. Um, we've also got the, these these ghost phones listed on the LUA Publications site. Um, so wherever you go, just yeah, definitely get one. I'm happy with happy that I did. Um, really happy, and uh, it's. It's good to be, uh, you know, getting getting closer and closer to getting off of Babylon's platforms and getting onto open source and, and privacy friendly ones. Um, so yeah, it's uh, libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. Yeah, it's uh, if you're interested. Yeah, go ahead, Jamin. Yeah, it's it, it is really getting a lot less difficult. Like as far as the amount of work that's required to modify the phones now, it's a drop in the bucket to what it used to be. Um. And it used to be really sketch how you would have to go to go about it. Um, basically, the, the old, you know, workflow of 
trying to take control of your Android phone was downloading some sketchy Chinese app that rooted it for you and then deleting the app, hoping it didn't leave anything <laughs> behind itself and then going through Android and trying to d disable and remove everything you can without breaking the phone. And like, I ran Android phones like that for a while and you still, you know, you you still can't get rid of Google Play services properly, or you know, you're still getting all that pinging to Google's network all the time. And but now with these, I mean, since they are developer-friendly phones, I mean, I just basically unlock the bootloader and have a system set up to flash them, and I plug them in and go through the deal. And you know, 20 minutes later, I unplug one, and it's a Calyx phone now. Like it's so much easier than what it used to be. Now, it took a lot of work to get that system set up like that, and to, I mean, there, there's a fair amount of, uh, like, to, to do a one-of of these, and that's why it's really worth, especially someone non-technical, to have just, you know, pay someone to mod them or buy one pre-modded, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of setup you have to do to do a one-of, and you have to really be up to speed on cryptographic signature verification and a lot of that stuff if you want to do it right. Um like every step of the way, every you know, everything I download, I'm verifying cryptographic signatures to make sure I wasn't man in the middle. I mean, it's like the attention to detail mm, is how yeah. you pull it off, and it's like a level of attention to detail that you have to be up to a certain speed to uh, be able to pull off easily without lots and lots of uh, you know um, effort to get up up to that level. For sure. Yeah, that's but uh, for the well said. but for certain lucky people with the right system, you can flash your phone through the web to um, Graphene. Graphene has yep. an online. Um, I was not able to get it to work on two systems, but um, I I run kind of weird things here, so. Yeah, I I actually had a, I bought in my in my. I guess a year and a year and a half ago, I was starting this transition off off of the spy phones, and uh, I bought a tablet and I tried to actually use yeah tr the Graphene Web Web one, but it didn't work with my I like I activated developer mode on the tablet and then um, tried to do it, but it didn't it didn't read that as an option, so I don't think that that one was compatible. But um, yeah, it's it's I guess it's it's well, getting a little easier in that area at least. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, well, it the thing is, it uses this like Web USB API that passes the USB port directly to the browser. And if that isn't all, that subsystem isn't all working and like all the stars and planets aren't in alignment, it doesn't work. <laughs> That's what I, you know, that, but so, I mean, the more browsers support that, the more it'll work, but is, I mean, on another level, like why do I want my browser accessing my USB ports? It's a good point, directly? yeah. Like, you know, <laughs> you know what I mean? <sighs> yeah, problematic for sure. But, that's that's a whole other discussion. Yeah, yeah. So um, um, I guess uh, is there anything else you want to mention specifically about uh, about the ghost phones? I know um, I want to talk a little bit about the Freedom Box, and then um, once we talk about Freedom Box a little bit and the update that you you provided to with to, uh, provided uh, with me on uh, on Matrix, um, then we'll kind of talk more about your overarching uh, overarching plan if that works. But at, at the moment, do you have anything else you'd like to mention about the sure, ghost sure. phones specifically? Um, well, just right now that my focus is on affordability, I can do like up to a Pixel 5. Um, and you know, in, in, in my own justification, I can't justify that type of coin on a mobile device that, you know, and of course that's a whole other rant of mine, but, um, but you know, if someone wants a custom one, you know, I can totally... You know, if they send in a compatible phone, I can do it for a price. Or I can, you know, if they want to put an investment down on one, I can um, procure one and get them get them one of the higher-end phones. But, like, right now the focus is on getting these in people's pockets instead of spy phones. So I'm trying to – I'm even – I'm trying to find a $100 one. I'm trying to find one that I can get out the door for 100 bucks. So um, – you know, that's kind of my focus with the whole project is like affordability to get these into people's hands. And it's, is, you know, segue into the Freedom Box. It's the same thing with that, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, the more people that have, you know, legitimate infrastructure that they own, 
um, the more network effect that has. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is really about, you know, building the second realm communications infrastructure. Yep, for sure, for sure. Um, <clears throat> very good. So I guess the, the one of the updates on Freedom Box I'll start with, um, we talked about it a little bit, or we talked about Freedom Box a little bit, um, but, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so yeah, you covered, uh, you uncovered some, I guess, some, some possible info about Matrix, uh, maybe not being such a good idea, um, uh, since it's uh, apparently a, dating, d a data mining hub um, tied to uh, Mossad or Isla Israeli intelligence, of all, of all fucking things. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, 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 it's, it's bizarre. Yeah, bizarre. Do you want to talk, talk, you want to mention anything else about that, what you, what you found out? Yeah, sure. Let me, uh, let me get my... my notes so I'm Fucking saying the right thought. words about it <laughs> <laughs> so yeah so basically they are the the you know original developers of that app were people that were working for this um I'm trying to remember the name of the company that's why I'm looking to the it's notes like here comms, wasn't it yeah I think that's what it was named but um they end up being an intel is Israeli intelligence connected company that Amdocs Amdocs basically yeah okay that's it so they were they they're like a telco metadata collection company and um, they basically have collected the metadata on a lot of the uh, telco stuff in the U S and they have a lot of that stuff on you know in files on record now. And um, basically, it's really sketchy, their involvement with making Matrix, because even though Matrix has good encryption, and no one can see what you're talking about with other people, there is a ton of unnecessary metadata that is being used for the network. And the default with Matrix, even when you make your own instance of a Matrix server, is it gives that metadata to matrix.org. Mm -hmm. And um, really, this is something that people, you know, I don't think there's the awareness level, you know, the conscious awareness that there should be about how metadata is just as bad as them reading your exact conversations at this point. Mm -hmm. um, because they can intuit what you're talking about by the metadata. They don't have to have solid evidence it's all based on algorithms and what they intuit so if you have the right metadata or the wrong metadata they intuit different things about what you're up to so i mean that's really the the danger so matrix has all this unnecessary metadata on all the users that isn't needed for the type of application that it is yeah. so all that metadata is um, can be used against people in the future, and probably is right now. So, even though it's you know the, the logic of it all, you know if you just look at Matrix, of uh, you look at its white papers and everything, it looks pretty good. But I really don't think solutions like that are worth putting effort into at this point. When there's other things like X X. MPP that you know it's basically metadata less and it accomplishes all the same things and it's arguably even you know more secure encryption wise um so it's i don't know it's like we we got to all put our effort you know behind these projects that are close to as ideal as possible yeah now, Matrix claim to fame is it's easy to transition from Telegram. But, you know, at this point, you know, self-liberators, we are fighting against the most technologically advanced surveillance state ever known to humanity. We can't do what's easier. What's easier is going to be the wrong thing. It's, I mean, it, we are taking countermeasures to the super advanced technological, you know, technological surveillance state. And there's going to have to be sacrifices because that's what this is. It's, you know, it, I, 
it's something that it doesn't seem that's in con in many people's consciousness enough that this is an electronic war. It's not mm -hmm. like I'm not talking Coke versus Pepsi when I'm talking Linux versus Windows or you know any of this stuff. This is like we need to be able to communicate. This is how we can do it with without you know these are the countermeasures that we can take to actually be able to communicate end of list there there aren't any other options like anything easier doesn't work because it's cheese in a trap mm -hmm. you know and that's the thing about like these big social networks that are coming out that are supposed to be the alternatives <laughs> you know if it's centralized and it's not running free and open source software you know if it's not a honeypot now it's going to be mm -hmm. i mean it, this the technocratic state is a master at co-option. I mean, that's how the the whole empire has rolled this entire time, is they're very good at co-opting grassroots resistance and turning it into controlled opposition. Mm -hmm. That's okay. how it's worked from, from the gate, from, you know, the U.S. empire learned it from the British empire. So um, all these little, you know, all these um, alternatives that are popping up that aren't, that don't have their shit together on the software side um, are just going to be easily co-opted. So, you know, all these solutions that I'm trying to put forth are the ones that aren't easily co-opted. You know, like, I liken it to, you know, if you read any James C. Scott talking about Zomias and about how these cultures that have escaped the state, they had to, they had to adopt technology, like cultural technology, that had resistance to the state be one of the key factors to, you know, its efficacy. Mm -hmm. Like, even the types of, you know, they, they, he talks about the types of crops they grew. You know, they found different crops to grow that were resistant to the state's influence and um, um, manipulation. It wasn't easier for them to grow those crops you know, none of this was easier, mm -hmm. but they had to adopt this technology because the state would infiltrate them cognitively and make another state amongst them if they didn't realize, you know, if they didn't cut it off at the root. Right. And um, that's really where I'm coming from right now is like we, you know, we, you know, I hate the word, but, you know, self-liberators in general really need to know how to cut the state off at the root at this point, because it's going to keep growing back if you if all you're doing is hacking at the branches. Right. Yes. That's, so like that's we have to develop true. technology, you know, that we have to develop technology that is resistant to the state's co-option. And that means it has to be distributed. That means it has to be free and open source. And, you know, a lot of people, you know, still don't quite grasp what free means in that context is freeze and freedom, meaning that no one can control it anybody with the knowledge can take control of it if that technology is turned the wrong way. That's what the freedom's about. The freedom is about being able to remove the spyware. It's being able to, you know, the freedom to, you know, part of the free part about all this with the phones is the freedom to de-Google them. Um, that's what the where the freedom is. It's not like free of price. You know, a lot of people really confuse like free software with freeware, and it's it's a philosophy. And like, uh, I think the more people understand the core philosophy of the free software movement, um, the the less they'll be tricked by these easily co-optable alternatives that um, they're putting all their energy into. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's definitely true. That's definitely true, and and uh, it's like uh, yeah, back in you know around when twenty twenty came, um, you know it was it was uh, you know even before that you know like the the time to di to to start disentangling from Babylon was you know, like a long time ago, but especially a couple of years ago, and uh, now it's you know further and further you know off of uh, um, you know off of the the main communication networks, off of the main uh, um, off of all the main hardware and arc and infrastructure. Um, and, and yeah, onto our, onto our own, um, that's, that's definitely the direction things are going. So let's, let's talk a little bit about, um, you mentioned XMPP and, and, uh, Jitsi, I think, 
And uh, I remember back in twenty yeah. back in twenty fifteen when I first used Jitsi, um, it was actually a downloadable client, and it actually took some some. It wasn't hard, but it was you know a handful of steps of of setting up the client and you know connecting to an XMPP server, and that was a manual step back then. Uh, it's not anymore. Um, yeah, it's, it's it's not anymore. But uh, you you talked about that being a a pretty easy alternative to to Matrix at this point. So, um, would you? Yeah, I guess tell, tell us about tell us a bit about how that would look and and, and act and, and and function and how 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 we we would uh, use that if you could. All right. Well, first I'll I'll talk about why it's good. It's good because it has very high quality end to end encryption. It is actually the protocol behind a lot of the commercial chat services that have come and gone. Um. It, uh, I think WhatsApp, I think it was the primary chat protocol that WhatsApp was using until they transitioned to something else, hmm. probably for IP reasons, um, because, you know, XMPP is completely free and open source. So, you know, XMPP is like email, right? Being that it's its own service. And just like email, you have an email client or an XMP, you know, XMPP client that you use to connect to chat. Um, so basically it gives a lot of flexibility. So there are multiple clients out there for different operating systems. And if one client does something that the users don't like, and since it's free and open source, everybody that wants to know can look at what it's doing under the hood. You simply jump ship to a fork of that client that doesn't do that. I mean, that is, that is how we win. You know, so, I mean, that's what's good about Jitsi or, or you know, I mean, XMPP. Jitsi actually uses XMPP mm -hmm. on some level. But what's what's good about it, it's an open standard. It's very mature. It's been around for a very long time. Um, it has very good encryption and it is very easy to use at this point. It's like setting up an email client. Your address is literally whatever your username is at whatever the server's name is, just like email. So like Shane's on my server is Shane at ghostpad.net. So you put that in and you put your credentials in and you connect just like an email client. And then once you're connected, you have all of the features you'd come to expect in a modern communications platform. You have audio, video, text, groups, um, and the like. Now there are some eccentricities to it because it is the, you know, the clients and the infrastructure, the way it's implemented is designed for security and privacy. It doesn't store your conversations on multiple devices and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, there are ways to make that stuff happen, but for security and privacy reasons, it just doesn't. Like, um, So basically the way it works is there's a server that runs the app, you know, runs a server application and then... Um, there are clients that that's how they access the XMPP network is they connect through the server and the servers can be run on your own hardware or they can be run on um, a virtual private server on the cloud that, you know, it's basically like a leased apartment in, in the city, you know, alleg an allegory, um, or you can run it out of your house. Or you can use one of the publicly available servers and get your address there. It's a federated network. So that means that once you have an address on one server, everybody who has opted into the federation can then communicate with each other regardless of what server they're registered to, just like email. So, it, you know, it works very much like email because that's really how the internet was made to work. It was supposed to be distributed it was supposed to have a lot of client side stuff going on and it was supposed to be federated like this new model, this, you know, this model of the corporate cloud, um, mm -hmm. you know, Gulag is not how the internet was supposed to work from the people who made it as a tool for human liberation. That's, this is not, you know, this is not how any of this is supposed to work. Like, this is how it was supposed to work from the get-go. 
that you had, you know, independent people on the internet operating their stuff and um, it made it resilient and it made it, you know, it made it very hard to control. And, um, you know, a lot of the activists these days are like people of my generation, you know, like Gen X and like, you know, like, like the tail end of the boomers that um, grew up and remember what it was like. Like, I remember what, a, like, a, the frontier the internet used to be. And I remember the, the transition from, you know, the amount I was able to learn with the resources around me to transitioning into the realm of the internet. Like, you know, people don't remember what it was like to be limited to, like, the knowledge of the people around you and whatever books you could get your hands on physically like it was such a game changer in you know human consciousness that we we can't let them take it away you know yeah that's yeah that's true i i uh i maybe i mentioned on the on the podcast recently but um yeah i've noticed that or i know it's a pasnia um, telegram chat but i used to be able to do like quite a bit of research like using the internet um, but I can't, like, I, I, I really can't anymore. It's just podcasts that lead me to books and then I read the books. Um, so yeah, like I, I've, I've definitely noticed that within the past five years. Um, yeah, within the past five years that it's certainly gotten a lot harder. Like, uh, every once in a while I'll stumble across something like really, really significant, but it takes a while. Um, it's definitely a lot more of a control to, you know, walled garden. Um, unfortunately. Oh yeah. But, uh, I, I think with, uh, you know, like that, that's, that's one reason I want the Pazni library to library to exist is so you connect to that one, you know, you, you connect to that one thing and you've got access to all of that. Um, you don't have to go, you know, <clears throat> you don't have to go searching. It's never going to disappear. It's going to be seated on many, on many, many freedom boxes. And, uh, then eventually yeah, down, down the road awesome. and eventually down the road, um, it's still far, a little far out right now, but maybe when we have like a hemp paper outfit or something, it's part of the network. Um, but an actual physical library too, where we've got like a, a fucking laser printer going all the time, just you know, like printing off books from the internet yeah, and then, like binding awesome. them, and then just we've got like every single Pasnia is in like a, its own library of Alexandria, perhaps, um, to put it in a really cheesy way, I guess. And I'm over here like, ooh, I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have some walls of books. I'm a book hoarder. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, oh, that's, that's, and, uh, uh, I found you something good. cool. Oh yeah, go ahead. So a while ago, there was this project that was called CD3WD or something like that. And it was this project that they were trying to get all the informational resources together to build a civilization. And it was like, I want to say nine DVDs worth of PDFs. Mm-hmm. And I have that for the Pasnia, Pasnia library. It's like 100,000 PDFs or something crazy. <laughs> right on, right on. On how to do everything. That's awesome to hear. Yeah, so I, yeah, I dug that up. I was able, I had a, I had DVD copies of it from back in the day. And thankfully they actually worked. Like this get corrupted after so long. And then I found on archive.org the other discs that I didn't have, so I downloaded them, so I have, like, the whole thing, and it's just this massive data dump of PDFs on, like, <laughs> doing anything, like, homesteading stuff is good. You'll, you'll appreciate it. Right on, man. Right on. Yeah, I need to, uh, um, but hey, the, I got the phones, the, I got the, you know, the, the ghost phone all set up and got to use that, so that's a, that's a big step. I'm not gonna say, like, I, I wish I would have gotten to more, um, but, uh, um, I need I need to get more to I need to get to the Pasnia library though and actually get that archive put together. Um, there's at least a probably probably at least a terabyte or two of stuff that that I know for sure. Um, Bill Cooper's entire library um, that I that I got like I've been trans I've been transferring from computer to computer to hard drive to hard drive uh, for like seven years since I came That's across really it. Cool. So um, that'll that'll definitely be there. There's a lot of really good uh, you know old occult material, a lot, a lot of books there. Um, but. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I want to make. I, I don't want to keep you too long today, and I want to make sure we have plenty of time to talk about um, 
you know, talked about the ghost phones and the freedom boxes, which are individual components and an overall overall uh, architecture, I guess, you're putting together um, your vision for, you know, like uh, um, for personal privacy and autonomy. So um, do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, I guess, uh, whatever you'd like to share about that, the overall vision? Sure. Yeah, um, it's, you know, it's basically security through car compartmentalization. And um, it is probably the most effective security model you can do. And what it, you're basically only allowing certain activity on certain devices that have certain, um, you know, trustworthiness to them. So basically the way, the way it would work on a real simple system is that you would have an exoteric and an esoteric level to what you're doing digitally. Your esoteric level would be like your home or like it would be like in permaculture terms like ring zero mm -hmm. or zone zero and zone one, you know, that would be where you um, have your most trusted devices and your personal data and everything else. Mm -hmm. And then you would have a mediator between layers and that's where the ghost box freedom box comes in. And then you have the like exoteric layer, which would be um, a lot less private and secure, but that's okay because you're only allowing activity on there that doesn't matter as much if it's private and secure. Um, and the best way to do that is to have devices that are dedicated to doing specific things on specific layers. Um, so, ex for example, a, a strategy, a good strategy one could have for, you know, privacy and security integrating mobile devices would be to have a ghost phone set up um, for exoteric stuff, for mainly used out of the house on the outside layer of things, and you don't bring that into your inside network. That's like your, you know... That's your device you use when you're out and about. Mm -hmm. um, so then you have a, like a device, let's say a, a laptop that's game capable or whatever, or a desktop for games if you're into gaming. And that's basically all that does. And that has the cleanest software you can put on it, but... You know, if you're playing online games and you're playing like Steam games and stuff, your system's compromised, period. You know what I mean? Like, there's nothing you're going to do that is going to make that a super trustworthy system to put your private information on. Mm -hmm. if, you have, if you have Steam or something like that, just forget about it. So, just dedicate a system to that. Don't put anything private on it. Don't use it for anything but entertainment. Um... It should still be Linux. You know, it should still be something that's reasonably trustworthy. I mean, that's if not, you put that's not just going to sell Windows you computer, out. Make it make someone work for it. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, at least you're not going to have the operating system level ratting out that you do with Windows and Mac OS. You know, exactly. Um, yeah. So, and then have a, another system on your internal network that you do your private stuff on, something like a ghost pad. That would be like an, ex an extreme or just another Linux computer that is all just set up for, um, you know, the personal stuff you're doing. Um, ideally, a Cubes computer is good for that because you can further compartmentalize within the computer and make it look like it's multiple computers doing the things, right? But for your basic system, so I'm talking about like a... In in, outside of the house phone, a, a uh, ghost box freedom box to do the networking services to tie everything together, and a couple devices in your internal network, in your esoteric side, that are trustworthy enough to be on that side, but are compartmentalized to run the applications in order of the trust, right? If that makes any sense. Mm-hmm. Um, so we, and also within that system, like if you want to, if you're someone that likes to consume, 
media and internet on a mobile device, you would have a separate mobile device that's only configured for Wi-Fi for internal use, right? So something like one of the ghost tablets that I have available would fit that bill really well and probably, you know, really better than the phone you have in your pocket because you have a seven inch display to read on, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's just, um, you know, realizing there's risk to what you're doing and, you know, mitigating those risks by compartmentalizing what you're doing on the different devices. So if someone owns your gaming laptop, or your gaming computer, that they're not, they're only getting what you're allowing on that gaming network of your data. Um, you can lock down the mic and lock down the, uh, <clears throat> the camera on the system, especially on a Linux system where it's, you have, you know, more control and there's nothing in the background going to turn it on. Um, so, I mean, that's, you know, in, in a nutshell, it's just security by compartmentalization. Mm -hmm. And in order to make it a reasonable expect, you know, a reasonable um, expenditure, um, I'm choosing really high value systems for each role. Like the sky's the limit for, you know, each component in the system. And you can spend a lot of money on each thing. But I'm pretty confident that I can build someone an entire like an entire personal information system for probably about the price of a MacBook Pro out the door. So that's really what I'm going for. Mm -hmm. Is like an, an entire personal information system that is security and privacy hardened on every level that it's available, that's turnkey and easy to use um, at an entry level price that's equivalent to, you know, um, a, a new laptop, uh, a, a uh, um, an expensive new laptop, right? You know, a couple grand would make an entire information system for somebody, and a nice one at that, even. Right, right. So, so question um, about uh, yeah. a question that just came to mind with Freedom Box. Um, have you are you familiar with RetroShare at all? It's like a file sharing type platform. Um, with obviously more more features than just that uh, than just that, but um, it was yeah, no, open source. No, I've never heard of that. Yeah, well, uh, Brian Sovereign had a server set up um, a few years back that I hopped on and tried out. But people would post, they would upload their you know videos and music and all of that up there and um, podcasts or videos, what, whatever people wanted to put up there, and then you could go in and select what you wanted to download from what people have decided to um, to post there. So yeah, it was just like a, a file sharing, information sharing platform. So obviously messaging and, and, and things like that. But I wonder if there's uh, something like that on the Freedom Box. Um, pretty, pretty neat. Hmm. Well, I know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of ways to share files. Mm -hmm. um, like the, the default sharing makes it super easy. Um, the way it works is anybody with the Freedom Box login that has the permission, and when you create the user, you can, I mean, it's it's a very easy interface to do all this. You can click that they have access to your, your uh, Freedom Box private shares, and then they just basically have access through their web browser to everything. So, you know, it would be very simple to, you know, if you were in a, you know, XMPP chat with somebody to just, you know, throw them the link to the private share mm -hmm. and then they just, you know, you know, get it through HTTPS. Gotcha. So, you know, encrypted, encrypted web browsing. Makes sense. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's really simple to do that way, but there are, I would even say some of the apps would just make it more complicated. <laughs> I mean, you, you have like this set of shares and you give somebody a link to it and then they, you know, but I don't know. That's fair. But yeah, I'm, I'm sure there's, I, I'm pretty sure even in like the different chat clients, you can, I've never transferred files, but I know you can. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. Just take some, some testing and, and, and figuring out. Um, but yeah, that's we'll look, looking forward to it. That's what, uh, as per the 20, 2021, 2022, uh, passing stakeholder bulletin, it's, uh, basically, 
um, expanding the network, like uh, get put get you know getting some work done on the directory and the you know the private directory and the private map of Pasnias, and then also um, the digital second realm. I had a a buddy come stay here for like a week, or we had I guess a Pasnian come stay for about yeah about a week, um, around New Year's, and uh, he's gonna be do he's doing some work on the website and coming up with some solutions in that area. So um, yeah, we're we're definitely looking to really really push forward on the digital second realm and the uh, the ghost phones. You know we're we're kind of getting the um, the necessary components to to people actually being able to you know facilitate communication and interaction in this digital second realm. So it's it's all coming together, I guess, is the long, long roundabout, roundabout way that I put that. But uh, um, well, I have the yeah, go ahead. Well, I have that I have that one bug to chase down that you unfortunately the uh, ghost box I sent you had it, and what's happening is when I when I replicate the install. It's not enumerating the Ethernet on sometimes. <laughs> so I have to figure out, like, every time I install directly on onto the thing, like, it just works. But when I replicate the install by copying the install to another, another device, basically, it decides not to care about the network mm -hmm. adapter port. So I just have, there's, it's a stupid thing. And, it, um, you know, worst case scenario is I'm installing on each device just to get them out the door. It's a lot easier for me to just copy a SD card a thousand times than to, mm -hmm. you know, have to install. Like what I do is I basically make an image of my uh, my my first prototype that's good to go, and then I just push that image out to more devices, and that's always worked. Except this time, the Ethernet port is not cooperating. It's like being enumerated in a different way or something, and it's not coming up. So. That's what's wrong with yours, and um, it's an e it's an easy fix that's time consuming, and a and a harder fix that will save me time in the long run. So I'm I'm going to figure out the harder fix that saves me time in the long run. <laughs> understood, understood. Well, that anyway, makes sense. Yeah, it, it does. But, you it know, does, and lots of otherwise it's direction. good to go. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. So, is there was there um, anything else you wanted so, to, you know, to mention in, in regards to the the overall architecture of what you're talking about here? Yeah, um, I I probably w went too deep in the weeds and didn't give a I don't know like a, a basic overview. I went, so you know, basic overview is just on the device level is I'm going to offer the first package, which is simply going to be a ghost box and a ghost phone. That will give you a you know a privacy and security hardened server to run your own chat server on and all the other stuff the ghost box can do as well as a privacy hardened device to connect to your chat server so your device isn't ratting you out even though you're all encrypted and stuff basically yeah. because that's really the issue that we're dealing with with these you know ghost phones ghost pads whatever is that there's no way that you can organize, you know, with with other people and have these distributed tribes if you have a snitch in your pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. People are literally wearing wires all the time. They have a snitch in their pocket and they're trying to do clandestine things. That's never going to work. It doesn't matter how easy it is to do that way. <laughs> it's it's just not going to work. Like, I'm... Um, I, I harp on that, but it's just, I, from conversations I have with people, it's like I feel that a lot of people still don't get that part of it. It's like we're so much beyond like this is an ego thing that I like it this way and everybody should do it this way. It's like, no, this is the only way it's going to work. Like, right. I wish it would work other ways. You know, this isn't even – I mean, I'm doing this because like I know how to and I feel that like I have to because yeah. there's not enough people doing it. This isn't like what I would do with without the world burning right now, right? Like, I would do something else. I'm doing this to uh, get the technology out there because it has to get out there. Or else everything else we've done is, like, pointless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's, de that's definitely true, man. That's definitely true. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, no, like, it's, it's, uh, it's interesting. I, I mean, I... I, I just kind of the way that I've thought and the people that I kind of the, the main core people that I kind of hung out with for 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 years were all really really you know strong adherence to security culture, 
So like I, it's still like I still see people in the Liberty community that are just really really bad on that note, um, like just just really bad, um, and it's and, yeah you know it's it's crazy like you you look at the adversary you know the adversary at, at hand, um, or you know uh, you know the 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 powers that are trying to avoid and uh, yeah I mean <clears throat> I don't know <laughs> thank you, you well it's like <clears throat> you know. I don't know if it's like a generational thing too. Like I know, I, or at least it seems to me that, um, you know, the generation I grew up in was a lot more down with security culture. Like it was more of a common thing because everything that has happened to, you know, ruin people's privacy was protested pretty hard by the people I knew at the time. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, and I'm one of those people too. Like I didn't get a cell phone. I like, I held out as long as I possibly could. I got one because I needed one to function at a certain level. And even then I've never had my name tied to a cell phone, like ever. Mm -hmm. I've never like bought a phone plan from someplace. It's always been a burner phone. But I learned that as a part of security culture of how I grew up. Like there was a looming threat of getting busted all the time. And you paid attention to that shit because if you didn't, you could go to jail. Um, I don't know. It's like growing up in that environment and it, it was, you know, it was all, it was all drug war bullshit, right? It was, you know, people smoked weed. And if you wanted to smoke weed and be free at the same time, you had to have security culture. Sure. But I don't know. It's kind of, I feel like the, the old man yelling at kids on their skateboards now. Yeah. It, it is what it is. I mean, the security culture these days is pretty lax. I mean, there's like 19, 1995, Jamin, you would never fucking convince me to put a tracking device in my pocket under any circumstance ever. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. We definitely. might come to blows over that shit, you know, like it's the incremental wearing down of people, you know, of security call of the culture of security, right? Like, you know, we had developed a cultural technology of security and it's has been stripped away through many means, you know, right. boiling frog pot. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's definitely true. That's definitely true. Um, so Jamie, we'll be going for about an hour, hour, coming up on an hour and fifteen minutes. Um, I'll kind of just uh, turn it over to you one more time. Generally, uh, any any closing thoughts for um, for the listeners here? That, uh, um, yeah, on anything we've discussed or or anything else you're working on. Um. Let's see. Yeah, I th I think I pretty much explained everything as well as I can. I am working on my website. The website that's up is very much a work in progress, but what I'm doing is I'm adding, I have a bunch of blog posts that are half written that I have to uh, basically finish and add to the site. And a lot of that's going to detail the, the strategy that I'm talking about and have the details about the devices and how they're used and what apps and why. And, you know, it's a, uh, it's going to be a pretty good information resource that I will eventually roll into a manual. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I have a hard time communicating what exactly that I'm trying to do because it is kind of a, you know, a large undertaking. Um, and people usually tune out when I use too many acronyms. Dude, so I, I, I I'm really trying that. to make a I website. <laughs> Yeah, that's been so the, I'm trying to make the a entire website past two years can... trying to explain what the fuck Pasnia is. Um, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. Struggle is totally real with that. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just trying to, like, get to the point where I can communicate what I've been trying to do these, these years. Because this is not – I didn't just – you know, that's why I called my initial thing Neuron. Because I was trying to make a neural network of uh, – you know, second realm network of – a new internet kind of thing, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, this is an overarching project that I've been working on for a long time, and all these little pieces of the puzzle, like the ghost phones, ghost pads, 
you know, those are just, those are necessities to make it work. Um, and, uh, you know, this might actually eventually roll up into being able to build a distributed network of mini data centers to be able to host self-liberator content on hardware that is trustworthy, or at least being run by, you know, people that have earned the, earn the trust through the various vetting methods and security culture, right? Like, mm -hmm. and not just strangers, um, strangers that are, you know, have every other motivation to be bad actors. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's eventually where this is probably going to go. I've actually specced out servers and stuff, and I'm going to lab it up and make one and uh, see where that goes. But right now, just getting a, a basic server into every self-liberator's network that can do everything from the mesh networking in the future, because all these ghost boxes do mesh networking. It's, Hell yeah. it's a switch. Um, you just have to have enough of them around to make it relevant, right? Mm -hmm. So let's get enough of them around first to build the infrastructure because that's what we're doing. You know, that's what I'm doing is I'm trying to get the infrastructure out there. And this isn't, you know, I'm using all, you know, all very mature open source projects. So if I disappear tomorrow, this whole system just keeps going. It doesn't matter. I'm not, I'm just like, I'm just the dude in the trenches setting it up for people. Um, all the resources to implement everything that I'm advocating will be pointed to in my website. Anybody can do what I'm doing and take over from me. So that's very important too, is to not have single points of failure. Right. Right. Yes. For sure. so I don't know. I guess that's, <clears throat> um, yeah, but otherwise I think I've, pretty much covered all the bases right on right on well um obviously when as, as we uh make more progress and 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 the the then and the pieces start coming together for me more too which i mean they they do for pasney every day so they will for this too um once we uh you know get more uh more knowledge on how it's coming together we'll have to get you back on to to cover that and and obviously anytime you got updates or or anything like that, and and we do need to. I know I know you got a lot on your plate, and you're focused on the mobile, but we need to uh, put another Vani pad on the uh, LUA site. Um, that first one went quick. Oh, I, definitely. I have a, I have That'll a feeling that. That'll be sooner that, uh, than later. Okay, right on. Yeah, I have a feeling we could get. We could. I'm sure people are looking for those too. Uh, maybe not with all of the stuff that was in that first kit. Well, but um, yeah. Yeah, I'll, just like a basic one, like the first one you got with the tail stick. You know, mm -hmm. you know, decent hardened Linux on the hard drive. Excuse me. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I can have those going real quick. It's just putting a, devoting a, a couple hours to putting them all together and putting OSs on them. Yeah. So that's good. And um, so what I'll do is I'll just earmark those for your site, dude. Like, I'll just put them together, um, send you some pics, and uh, we can just go from there. And those will just be right just, those will just be the Vanu pads. And by the time those sell, I'll have more. Sweet, that works. That's uh, that's fantastic. So, Jamin, your your website is neuron.ghostpad.net. Um, anything else before I let you go? Yep. No, nope, I really enjoyed being on here as always, and really appreciate uh, the help you've given the operation here. Hey, always happy to me. Any, anytime I can, always happy to. All right, Jamin. Well, until next time, man, I, I appreciate it. And we'll, we'll definitely uh, definitely be in touch. So, um, guys, there you have it. Jamin Baconic from neuron.ghostpad.net. Um, one final, I'll, I'll remind you uh, remind you real quick, as I did in the uh, introduction, uh, the first event of year two here at Pasnia has been announced. Um, it is uh, March 31st to April 4th. Uh, marks our now annual spring camping event uh, here at Pasnia. All vetted Pasnians, uh, self-liberators are encouraged to attend. Um yeah, not not much on the docket. Land bird processing, um, cleaning out a, a shed here on the property as we transition the remnants over to the uh, other larger field, and uh, obviously just a great weekend of liberation. Uh, hope to see you out that see you out here, uh, March 31st to April 4th. And uh, if you need to get vetted, uh, yeah, just visit pasnia.com. Uh, you know, get into the uh, committee of correspondence. We can we can find someone digitally, I'm sure, um, that can uh, vouch for reputation. But uh, yeah, with that, vanupodcast.com is the website for everything Vanu. And uh, yeah, until next time, guys. See ya. 
2048, the second volume in the Brushfire Thriller series, takes place in the not-so-distant future. In the second half of the 21st century, the War of Ideas took place. The creation of second realms and individualist decentralized freedom cells spread across geographical regions, and the practical ideas of liberty, voluntary interaction, and peace took hold. The Free Society in 2048 is loosely based on Samuel E. Konkin III's Phases of Agorism, in which the destruction of the state would be realistically accomplished through the establishment of pockets of free individuals, black and gray markets, and the spreading of the ideas of freedom and liberty, until the demand for an overarching state was no longer perceived as essential, and individualism and voluntary interaction prevailed. The original creators of the Freedom Cells who led the world to a better place are still scattered about living their lives, including Maxine, the late Henry Tucker's love, and the now washed up but stubborn punk rocker Warren still reside in the Appalachian Mountains. Maxine's nephew, Vince, and his boy Tommy, who had been van nomads ever since Tommy's mom left to pursue a materialistic quest for fortune in the never-ending rat race, went to visit Auntie Max on her homestead on Jim Mountain Road. Although Max is very happy for the visit, she has an ulterior motive. Her close friend she met during her revolutionary days, Isaac Hopper, is trapped in a geographical area previously known as New York City, now known as the State Zone. The State Zone is one of only a handful of remnant states where an overarching power-hungry government rules over its citizens with aggressive force. Together, Warren, Vince, and Tommy team up and use their knowledge, including advanced hacking techniques, low-tech ciphers, IRC-encrypted chat, and cryptocurrencies to infiltrate and evade the authorities in the State Zone and bring back Isaac to freedom. But their mission, the rescue of Isaac, Auntie Max's close friend and confidant, isn't going to be easy. They're up against a powerful authoritarian Hydra state, a massive surveillance apparatus, a relentless and murderous police state, and a propaganda arm that will not stop until extremist terrorists known as the Trio, Warren, Vince, and Tommy, are brought to justice. Will the Trio pull off the rescue of Max's longtime friend, Isaac Hopper? Will the forces of good, free individuals, prevail against the safest forces of evil? Find out in the second volume of the Brushfire Thriller series, 2048, available exclusively via Liberty Under Attack Publications. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048. Again, libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048, or snag them both in the Brushfire bundle. libertyunderattack.com forward slash 2048 bundle. Liberty Under Attack Publications, share your story, find your freedom.